So that brings us to the next question. Okay, it's not rotator cuff. It's not an old patient. Younger patient has come with recurrent dislocation or maybe pain. The surgeon is suspecting instability. What are the three questions you want to answer? Is there a labral tear? Is there bone loss? And what's happening to the capsule? So this is what the surgeon wants to know. Let's start with labrum. Is there a tear? What is the extent of the tear? How big is it? And is there any associated bone fragment also? What do we see here? You can clearly see an anterior inferior labral tear. This is the intact posterior labrum. This is a Bankart's lesion in a patient who's had anterior dislocation. Another case, you can see labral tear, periosteum bit intact here. So maybe part like, but it's a little torn here. If intact, you can call it perthes. If you don't call these different fancy names, that's fine. Tell the extent of the tear. So we talk of quadrants. If I imagine this is the three o'clock, this is the 12, six, these are to the one and seven. So this is superior, posterior superior, posterior inferior, inferior, anterior inferior, and uh, anterior superior. So now I can tell that the tear is extend involving the anterior inferior quadrant from three o'clock to six o'clock position. Why this is important? Because the surgeon can then decide how many anchors he is going to put if he plans to do surgery. This is important. Every anchor, the cost will increase. So the patient obviously wants to know beforehand how much is going to be the cost of surgery. Surgeon needs to be prepared how many anchors he has ready. I may say a tear involving entire anterior labrum extending across 12 o'clock up to the posterior equator. So slap tears, for example, superior labral tears, you have a classification 10 types, 12 types. Do I remember all of them? No. If you tell this whole extent, that is good enough. So involving entire anterior labrum going across 12 o'clock up to posterior equator. So that tells you the extent of it. Is there also a bony fragment? So now with the labrum, there's this bony fragment. So again, non fat sac sequences help you. This is a bony bankard lesion. So it's not only labrum, but there's a piece of bone also which has come off with it. Give size of this particular bone. Has the labrum got displaced medially called as alpsa, anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion? If you don't call it so, just say anterior inferior labral tear displaced medially, that's fine. Has a part of the cartilage also adjoining come off? glenoid labrum articular defect so you have articular cartilage loss also out there so if you describe anterior inferior labral tear with this much size cartilage defect adjoining it means the same are there any associated findings for example here yes there is a posterior labral tear very clearly seen posterior inferior quadrant labral tear no doubt about that all of us have picked it but what else is happening there is a Little depression anterior superior humeral head with marrow edema. That means there has been a posterior dislocation. This is a subtle reverse hill sacs lesion. This is a posterior labral tear. Anterior dislocation, the patients will tell you. I feel my shoulder, is something is moving. I feel the humeral head popping. Well, there is something coming out. Posterior dislocation may not be like that. So when you see a labral tear, not enough to say it's a labral tear. See what is the cause. Can it? Here, again, I can see normal anterior labrum, tear of the posterior labrum. I can see osseous remodeling. Can you see this? Here you have a sharp glenoid and here you have an osseous remodeling. Posterior inferior glenoid osseous remodeling, posterior labral tear. Then I notice the capsule is lax. All three together, I can ask the surgeon to assess for posterior instead. So look at the pattern. I see a posterior superior labral tear. Clearly, there's a small incipient paralabral cyst which can enlarge sometimes and cause compression of the suprascapular nerve branches here. I also see a posterior supraspinatus anterior infraspinatus undersurface tear. Now, I find out the history. This is a young 29 year old guy. He is into sports, he plays cricket. So, overhead abduction activity. 
so overhead throwing athletes cricket gym going people doing bench presses badminton squash so all of them if you find this together posterior superior labral tear posterior supra anterior infraspinatus tendinosis tendon tears think of posterior superior impingement so you can put in your report please correlate clinically for posterior superior impingement impingement is not a radiological diagnosis but based on the constellation of findings you can advise you can suggest looking for it so that the surgeon knows that he needs to look for that now the next question is it really a tear now i start looking at this case and i feel that this labrum here is absent anterior superior labrum i barely see you can see how this posterior superior labrum is seen well okay i see a piece here so is this a labral tear yeah looks like but always when you feel something is like a tear trace it down when i trace that structure down i can see it is elongating and inserting on to the lesser tuberosity deep to the subscapularis tendon okay i see that on sag it is thick structure like this when i correlate it so this is a thick middle glenohumeral ligament and the anterior superior labrum is absent so this is a developmental condition called buford complex anterior superior labrum can have lots of variants it can be developmentally absent can be developmentally hypoplastic okay so this is a buford complex i just need to mention it and not confuse it with a tear that's all sometimes i may see a cleft at the base of anterior superior labrum is it a sublabral foramen which is a normal variant where the anterior superior labrum is not tightly attached or is it a tear how do i distinguish one thing you usually do not get only anterior superior labral tears it's usually an anterior inferior labral tear or a bankart's extending superiorly or it's a slap or a superior labral tear extending inferior so if you find rest of the labrum bang normal only anterior superior labral tear then you are thinking is this an sublabral foramen how do i make out sublabral foramen is seen in only about two or three sections you don't see it entire extent margins are smooth sharp not irregular and you can differentiate most of the times what if i just cannot make out and you have a labral tear only anterior superior small one here in two sections they'll not do anything for those tears anyways so it's i think it's still okay if you have not been able to distinguish and you have they can correlate for the labral signs and that usually doesn't happen as well at the base of superior labrum is there a smooth cleft going medial underlying cartilage is nice and intact that's a sublabral recess if it is a superior labral tear see how the bright signal is going laterally it's more irregular and you'll also see it extending anteriorly and posterior so that becomes a superior labral tear sometimes can get difficult you may sometimes very few times but it could really be difficult and then you try to look for other findings and you see whether clinically there are any labral signs next coming to the labrum we have seen patient has instability patient has bankart lesion bony bankart whatever it is is there a hillsacks lesion if so what is its size and is there marrow edema is it an acute situation so this is a hillsacks lesion it's very shallow this one is very deep but now we know more than depth so yes you give the depth also but what is more important is this transverse dimension so we always need to mention the transverse dimension of the hillsacks on the sagittal we give the supero inferior dimension also but this is what is more important and we do give this depth also but to the surgeon what is most important is this transverse dimension here i'll say mild flattening type hillsacks here i'll say a deep wedge shaped hillsacks give the transverse dimension superior and inferior dimension and the depth of it okay is it really hillsacks or not a recap if you see something right at the top where the humeral head begins like coracoid process and above it then it's hillsacks if that part of humeral head is bang normal and only inferiorly you see something smooth and nice like this that's a normal anatomic groove you can't have a hillsacks which is large and is extending all the way down 
but you will not have normal humeral head up and this small little thing here much below the coracoid that's a normal anatomic groove it's not healthy next the most important question the orthopedic surgeon always wants to know what's the glenoid bone loss what's the glenoid bone loss is it significant or not you look at articles there are so many different methods i'll talk about the one that we use so one quick visual look what is happening this is the normal glenoid pear shaped and here you can see straightening so that straight of the bat tells me this glenoid has some bone loss now i need to quantify it how much how do i do it we do use the best circle best fit circle method there are many methods whichever you use is fine we draw a straight line along the glenoid axis we put a circle which best fits the glenoid especially the posterior inferior quadrant now this circle i measure the posterior diameter and the anterior diameter they should roughly be equal if not so if for example this is the total diameter and suppose the bone is ending here so in this case if i just draw it okay this is kind of the circle it comes little down this should have been the total diameter but in reality this is the diameter so this minus this divided by this into 100 will give you the percentage bone loss this is how we do it you draw the circle you measure it and look at how much of bone loss is out here is ct better mr better we've been able to convince our surgeons that mr is enough most of the times i would say 95% of the time we give them but then it should be angled properly you should take non fat sat sat pd you should angle it to the parallel to the inferior portion of the glenoid if sometimes it's difficult we have a odd banana shaped glenoid or angle not taken properly or not sure then yes we do advise ct because a 3d ct is supposed to be the best way to identify and quantify the bone loss so you can see this much percentage is the bone loss what is the magic figure nothing usually about 20% 25% is when they operate they do a latage surgery why is it very important so there's no magic figure it's not like 19 i'll not operate 21 i'll operate because they take into account status of the labrum bone size of the hill sacs lesion as well as capsule all together it's not one single value there will obviously be some inter observer variability so when there is a large defect only repairing labrum is not enough surgeon will take a piece of this coracoid and attach it here to try to make it normal shape otherwise if he only repairs the labrum patient will keep having recurrent dislocation this is called as a latarge procedure and usually done open so that's why the surgeon wants to know beforehand what is the size of the bone loss concept of the last part i am on on track versus off track you can measure the glenoid track by taking 83% of the intact glenoid diameter from that you subtract this percent this amount which is the bone loss okay that's the glenoid track for example just to give you an example if that is 1.2 cm whatever just to give a random figure then you measure the hill sacs transverse dimension which we spoke about that's the hill sacs interval if glenoid track is larger than the hill sacs interval that means it's an on track lesion if it's large if it's on track lesion and there is significant bone loss he'll do latarge if no significant bone loss he'll do only soft tissue repair if it is an engaging lesion if the hill sacs interval is larger than the glenoid track that means it's a large hill sacs lesion then in addition to treating the inferior glenoid whatever he may do only soft tissue repair or latarge whatever it may be he'll also do a remplissage so he'll take the infraspinatus and attach it to this defect trying to make it less of a defect okay that's remplissage so whether he does only soft tissue repair whether he does bony surgery which is latarche or whether he also does a remplissage is what we are supposed to tell him anterior instability last two questions is the inferior glenohumeral ligament intact is the coracoid process intact because you can have injuries here you can see the inferior glenohumeral ligament which is the inferior capsule itself there is disruption from the humeral attachment humeral avulsion of glenohumeral ligament hagel lesion very important because the surgeon this is a blind area for him when he goes in so he needs to know this before the surgery to plan that he needs to repair so this is important question for him 
coracoid process fracture can be associated and if already there's a coracoid fracture he may not be able to use it for lethargy so he needs to know whether it's there or not so to conclude we need to know the anatomy obviously the first starting step we need to give the information which will decide the management we as radiologists need to have an active part in the whole process it's not enough sitting in our room reporting signing off the report and that's the end of it you need to have constant interaction with your orthopedician constant meetings clinical meetings where unless you understand the right questions you will never be able to give the right answers and shoulder there are a large number of variants be aware of them use the normal uh, the common principles and be sure to answer the questions